Kopczyński, będę tradycyjnie waszym dzisiaj gospodarzem. Na czacie i w ogóle dzisiaj na spotkaniu już mamy w tym momencie 223 osoby. Także bardzo się cieszę, że zaczynamy w tak dobrym stylu temat energetyki wiatrowej. Witam wszystkich stałych bywalców. Witam też wszystkich, którzy są po raz pierwszy na webinarze. Przypomnę, że my tutaj w Habitacie spotykamy się regularnie, najczęściej w środy i soboty. Czasem jak coś się popsuje, to, to też w poniedziałek, ale spotykamy się wokół różnych tematów, które w jakikolwiek sposób łączą się z wątkiem autonomii, samowystarczalności. Jak ci z was, którzy są już któryś raz na naszym spotkaniu, wiedzą, że to nie tylko są takie hardware'owe, sprzętowe tematy jak dzisiaj, też często, o, zniknąłem na chwilę, też często dotykamy tematów miękkich, organizacyjnych, ekonomicznych, ale one zawsze jakoś tam się wiążą z takim wątkiem suwerenności. Bardzo się cieszę dzisiaj, że, że w końcu doszło do tego webinaru, gdyż on już jest w planie już przynajmniej od roku, ale jakoś tak się nie, nie, nie składało. Jest drugie dno tego spotkania dzisiaj. Tak naprawdę te webinary służą, oprócz tego, że dla inspiracji wszystkich zebranych dzisiaj, do tego, żeby przedstawić podstawowe informacje, ale tak naprawdę chcemy budować społeczność osób, które interesują się danym wątkiem. Więc jeżeli oglądasz dzisiaj to, to spotkanie i jesteś pasjonatem, pasjonatką budowy turbin wiatrowych i chcesz mieć kontakt z innymi tego rodzaju osobami, koniecznie napisz do nas. Koniecznie napisz do nas, chcemy zbudować grupę osób, które chcą w przyszłości, w najbliższym czasie budować turbiny wiatrowe na otwartej dokumentacji. Także koniecznie, koniecznie napisz. Kilka słów takich organizacyjnych. Spotkanie jest nagrywane, więc i, i będzie rozesłane do wszystkich z biletem dla fanów. I tutaj serdeczne ukłony. Dwa razy to zrobię. Kłaniam się bardzo nisko. Bardzo dziękuję osobom, które wybrały taki właśnie bilet, ponieważ to dzięki wam ten temat może u nas się rozwijać. Dzięki wam robimy te webinary. Te webinary się rozkręcają i coraz więcej tych wątków się pojawia. Tak, u mnie jest dosyć chłodno. Tutaj mamy uchylone, uchylone okno, kultowy sweterek musi być. Także wszystko jest na miejscu. Możemy zaczynać. Słuchajcie, dzisiaj nasze zaproszenie przyjął Paddy z Irlandii, który zajmuje się prowadzeniem warsztatów związanych z, z budowy takiej turbiny. Będzie też dzisiaj zmianka o tym, gdzie w Polsce takie, na takie warsztaty można się zapisać. A przepraszam, że ze Szkocji, dzięki Kasia z ekowioski Findhorn. Będzie wzmianka o tym, gdzie takie warsztaty w Polsce można od się na nich wyszkolić, także warto zostać do samego końca. I cóż, chciałbym rozpocząć dzisiaj krótkim filmem na temat tego, jak wygląda proces takiej, takiej budowy. Film jest kilkuminutowy, taki, taka kondensat z tego, o czym dzisiaj będzie prezentacja i te wszystkie wątki, te wszystkie szczegóły, o których, które będzie można zobaczyć na, na filmie, Padi rozwinie szerzej w ponad godzinę dzisiaj prezentacji. Bardzo wielka prośba, aby, aby zachować pytania na koniec. Proszę sobie tam gdzieś może na, na kartce notować co ciekawsze pytania. Będziemy mieli sesję pytań i odpowiedzi na sam koniec. Tutaj raczej starajmy się dbać o porządek na czacie, bo nie chcemy wprowadzać tutaj moderacji, chcemy, chcemy wam dać możliwość wypowiadania się, ale dbajmy wspólnie o to, żeby ten czat nie rozpraszał naszego prelegenta, i zadawajmy tylko naprawdę jakieś istotne komentarze, a, a sesja pytań i odpowiedzi będzie na koniec. Także ja teraz włączam, włączam już film króciutki i za chwilę wracam. Thank you. 
Hold it as you're banging it. There we are. It's coming. Say something. <laughs> Say something. Andy, Andy. Clara. 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 Give us some more, give us some more, give us some more. Yeah, okay. Narrow gap in winter, probably very bad. Ok, co, yy, zakończyliśmy oglądanie filmu. Tutaj już się Paddy pojawił. Hello Paddy. Hello. Nice hello. To you. hello, hello. Big uh, applause for Paddy, who will uh, say, uh, who will give a presentation to us today. Uh, I will add one more thing before, before I will let you to do the presentation. E, jeszcze przypomnę, e, albo nie przypomnę, bo nie powiedziałem jeszcze tego, ponieważ e, w trakcie tego, jak e, organizowaliśmy tutaj zapisy na ten webinar, e, zgłosiło się kilka osób, które profesjonalnie zajmują się energetyką wiatrową. E, także mogę Wam dzisiaj powiedzieć, że dzisiaj, szy, dzisiejsze spotkanie będzie pierwszym e, przynajmniej z dwóch e, spotkań. E, na drugim spotkaniu będziemy się zajmować szerzej, być może trochę więcej o teorii, o takim lokalnym aspekcie, jak to w Polsce wygląda z energetyką wiatrową. Dotkniemy też tematu pionowych 
e, turbin wiatrowych, także będzie, będzie można to rozwinąć. E, teraz przechodzimy już na język angielski, so we switch to the English. Uh, thank you, uh, hello again, Paddy. Now it's your turn. Please uh, go with the, your exciting presentation. <laughs> Uh, hello, hello everybody. Thank you for your welcome. Um, hello from Scotland. Um, and yes, th thanks for thanks for joining me. Thanks to the Cohabitat team for for giving me this opportunity. It's an honour to be to be addressing so many people um, using this fascinating technology, which is a first for me. So yeah, we're here today to. I'm going to talk you through the um, process uh, of building your own windmill. Um, and I'm going to do my best to keep an eye on the chat chat here to see if there's anything, any questions that come up as I go. Um, so yeah, I just uh, I think I've got control of this webinar here now. I think uh, I can change slides. Can I do that? I hope. <laughs> Al, can you help me? Are we, can I go to the next slide? Uh, just a second, uh, I'll give you... Uh, um, okay, right now, try it. Okay, I've just been asked to speak louder. I've turned my microphone up, so hopefully hopefully I'm uh, audible now. So thank you for joining us. Um, like Powell's introduced me, my name's Paddy Atkinson. I'm Australian-born, um, which will probably add to your difficulty with... Uh, understanding my English, but um, I now live in Scotland in the Fintorn Eco Village. Um, some of you may be aware of this place. Um, I live here with my family. Um, I'm a renewable energy systems engineer, so um, I'm, I've been working with energy systems in various capacities for, for uh, about 12 years now. And as you can imagine, in Australia it was a, it was a lot more um, focused on solar, but since I've moved to Europe, I've noticed that there's less sun and more wind. So this is where I now focus more of my attention. And and here in Findhorn, we have quite a lot of, uh, of wind capacity that that, um, that I work with directly. So moving along, um, I'd just uh, like first to acknowledge Hugh Piggott in this presentation. Um, Everything I'll be presenting today is based on a, a wind turbine designed by Hugh Piggott. Hugh, Hugh is a um, Scottish man who lives on the west coast of Scotland and 30 years ago he chose to, to move off grid and, and live in a very windy, barren part of Scotland where he began to explore wind power as an option for, for his energy supply. And for those of you who are more interested to explore this topic, then there's a web link there and you can find a lot of useful information on, on Hugh's site, along with um, this book which um, is a wind turbine recipe book. A lot of the figures I'm going to be presenting today are out of this book. And it, it, it um, for those of you who have uh, have got DIY skills and some tools, um, it's probably the best how-to guide I've encountered in, in how to do, to build anything. So if you, you can start from scratch and build a turbine if, you, if you've got the time and the commitment based on this, this book. Um, so let's start with the, 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 the more kind of grueling part first, um, some mathematics and then I'll, I'll move into the actual practicalities of, of, um, of what we, we do with, uh, with building these turbines. So fundamentally um, we start with how much power we can extract from the wind. Um, wind is a strange topic because there's, there's many different turbines we see um, on the internet um, and some of them claim very big results and, and um, fundamentally we come back to the question is how much, how much power can we extract from the wind um, and it's a, a question of kinetic energy. And this, this formula here is, is, the, is the governing equation as to how much power is in the wind. And essentially it's a, it's a relationship between the area of the wind turbine, 
we're talking about a, a propeller-based wind turbine here, so it's the area of the wind turbine and the velocity of the wind. Obviously, density is included, but density is relatively constant in the air. So, so maybe we can do a little sum. Hopefully, I can use my little pen here, um, and we can put it put it into perspective. Um, so, I don't know how well I can write here, but I'm going to try. So, the k we can ignore the k. I'll go back here. We can ignore the k from this formula. It's just a factor to change it from kilowatts to watts. Um, and yes, Bet's law is coming. I'm keeping an eye on the, on the side here. Um, for those who, who benefit from this, we've got, uh, if we've got a density of, oh, that's a strange colour. Let's say 1.2. My handwriting is terrible with the mouse, but uh, 1.2 kilograms per metre cubed. This may be my last, my last attempt at writing but I'm going to follow through on this. Um, let's say an area of 4.5 metres squared, which is about as, as the turbine size that we generally deal with. Um, metres squared, and then a five metres, five metres per second is a, is, a, is a common kind of a benchmark for wind power, so let's say five metres per second. And then, I'm going to do a quick sum here on my fabulous technology to give you the answer. So I've got density 1.2, area 4.5 by 5, divided by 2. Oh, something's going wrong there. Something's definitely wrong. Anyway, we um, I think of Oh, cubed. Excuse me. So my velocity is cubed. Um, anyway, to just give you the answer there, it's about 700 watts. So to put this into perspective, I'm talking about a machine which um, has a, a, a diameter of 2.4 meters across. So for that machine at 5 meters per second, we can get about 700, 700 watts. And as you'll see, the velocity is a cubic relationship. So it's it's... Um, the power we can extract is very dependent on the wind velocity. So moving along from that um, point, um, which I've just made, is velocity is, is key. We can't really govern velocity too much other than based on our sighting. And the, the basic rules there are to be as um, in an open space as possible, away from trees, away from buildings. And height is a really a key factor in extracting the most out of the wind. So if we can get it up high, we can get more wind. Um, obviously, there's constraints in, in how well we can do that with, with the towers we have. So someone's already jumped to, jumped to this um, this point. It's called there's a there's a there's a physical limit with how much we can extract from the wind from an axial thrust windmill, which is what we're talking about. And before I go any further. We're talking about a, a horizontal axis turbine. So the axis is horizontal, um, and it's like a propeller on an old plane, you could say. That's what we're talking about. There's another type of wind turbine, which is a um, horizontal, uh, vertical axis, sorry. And um, I'm not going to address any of, any of that technology. Um, the, the proof is in the pudding, is a saying from, from in English. Um, horizontal axis turbines perform better. They're more efficient and more reliable. So that's why um, I focus on them as a priority over the vertical. So I won't say any more than that. Um, hopefully everybody's still following me. Um, but let me just finish this point on the bets limit to say that of this power, that we can extract from the wind, we, we're left with only 60% of it can actually be extracted because of the the, error, uh, the, the, the physics of the fluid flow. Um, the blades will stall if we go over that, if we try and extract more than that, essentially. So graphically, we can say that this red line here is the power in the wind. The blue line is the bets limit, so we can only extract at maximum along that blue line or the wind speed at the bottom. 
and this is for a, a size for a, a certain time type of wind turbine. Obviously, different graph for a different size of, of turbine. Um, some other basic fundamentals for this um, this area of uh, science, I guess you could say, is uh, cut-in speed. And the cut-in speed is the, the speed with which we get useful energy or voltage out of the system. Um, and it, it usually, it depends on the design of the system, but it usually comes in around 3 to 5 metres per second. Um, the cutout speed is another interesting um, point, is the speed at which the machine slows itself to avoid being destroyed by high winds. So high winds uh, are potentially destructive in machines of this kind. Um, and these smaller machines employ a technique called furling. So they turn themselves out of the wind to avoid being sped up more and more and, and essentially being destroyed by some storm winds. So there are two other concepts. Let me just say a little bit more about furling. Um, and basically, you can see here these turbines we're dealing with uh, have a tail, and the tail most of the time keeps them into the wind. Um, let me try and get in the, ca in the camera here. The tail most of the time keeps them into the wind, balances them into the wind, and at such a point when the wind velocity gets too high, the tail turns around and turns the turbine out of the wind. You can see that diagrammatically represented here, um, and a little bit clearer in this diagram here. So if our wind's coming from this direction, um, the wind pushing on this wind vane here is, is enough to start to turn it round out of the wind, thus avoid, avoiding uh, us destroying the machine. Um, some real life practice, this is a one kilowatt machine, um, an example I've just uh, extracted here. And we can see down here, is uh, cut in speed around seven miles per hour. We're not talking meters per second anymore, but this is miles per hour. Cut in wind speed, then we increase our production to such a point up here where we cut out. And that's when the furling comes into play. So you'll see it it's continues to generate at higher wind speeds. It just um, is doing it from a side on angle. So it's still spinning, it's just not capturing all the power in the wind. So that's, um, that's where we're at. Um, and now we can see essentially the power in the wind available, the bets limit, and then the reality here. Obviously the reality is less due to inefficiencies in the system, um, which increase with speed. And the inefficiencies, for example, friction losses, um, electrical losses, they increase as speed increases. So um, that's a bit of a picture of what, what, you know, theory versus practice. So that starts to give you a bit of an example of how it goes. Um, so last, last thing I'll say in the sense of the physics and the kind of the theory, um, before we get on to something a little more interesting, there's another, another concept that's um, it's, it's important to, to be aware of is what's called the tip speed ratio. And the tip speed ratio is the ratio of, let me get in the camera here, the tip speed, oh, I'm terrible, um, tip speed compared to the velocity of the wind into it. Um, why that's important is because the, the maximum power you can extract occurs between a tip speed ratio of about 7.5 to 10. So, so to add to that, the power coefficient is the energy, electricity produced by the wind turbine divided by the energy available in the wind. And to put that into graphical form, um, we can see that the maximum tip, tip speed ratio is about 7 for, the, for this case. So that's when, when, when we're sitting down and designing a wind turbine, that's a really key characteristic of, of, of how we design the turbine. 
and um, and those design questions are a, a bit more of an advanced topic and, and be, I won't be going into detail about those today but um, but um, they're, they're involved if you're going to you know design from scratch which is totally possible um, all these concepts can be applied to your own parts and your own version of the design um, I choose to use this design because it's been developed by Hugh who who has 30 years of experience and um, whilst I can understand where he's coming from with his design I, I don't feel I need to reinvent the wheel so those of you who are interested in um, building something that will work then I think this is the right way to go. Okay so in practice um, what are we talking about? We're talking about a do-it-yourself windmill. Um, would Okay, sorry, Patty, make chat window bigger, please. Okay, how do I do that? That way. Is that better? Is everybody seeing anything? Nope. Not so big. <laughs> okay. Okay, here we go. That looks good. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, kilka słów wyjaśnienia. Słuchajcie, okno czatu nie służy do tego, żeby uprawiać tutaj czat na wszystkie możliwe tematy, więc dlatego jest małe, ponieważ wiele osób zgłasza, że, że jest rozpraszające, mimo tego, że można tym nie czytać, ale fakty, fakty są takie, że jednak to rozprasza, więc czat, okno czatu będzie większe w momencie, kiedy będzie mieli temat dyskusja, gdzieś pod koniec webinaru będzie mieli szerszą dyskusję, póki co czat jest mniejszy. Także można też po prawej stronie prze, przewijać, jak ktoś chciałby coś doczytać. Natomiast wszystkim prześlemy zapis czata po webinarze, także będzie mogła, można sobie zerknąć na linki. No, Adi, you can continue. Ok, so the chat window I assume is ok. Let's just change back to a normal size. So I'll trust that everything's ok. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that was what Pavel was talking about now. Okay, so carrying on. Um, here's an interesting table um, that shows monthly production versus wind speed um, and for a varied range of turbine sizes um, and also some estimated costs for materials. Um, Firstly, I'll say that if you're going to consider installing wind power, it's important to start to get an idea for what what average wind speed your site has um, and no sorry I don't have any about verticals that uh, in this presentation um, I, I did I did say before I've just got a, a question in the chat here um, that I, I choose to focus on um, horizontal axis machines um, in my work so just based on my experience with the inefficiencies of the other machines and 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 also just some of the challenges with the them mechanically um, so carrying on um, we it's good to understand what 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 um, how much wind you have on average across the year a good site five meters per second is a good site or average over the year um, so using that as a metric um, we can see let's say for this machine 2.4 meter diameter that's what it's saying um, at five, 5 meters per second we're getting about 93 kilowatt hours per month I'll just do a quick sum for you to give put that into perspective um, so 93 by 12 it's about 1100 um, kilowatt hours per year um, I'm assuming maybe in Poland you pay 15 euro cents for a kilowatt hour, I'm not sure if that's true. So essentially, you would, if you installed this machine, you would be saving 165 euros per year. Um, I'm not going to do the pound conversion, but let's say it's a payback of three to four years um, for that machine. Let me add though that this these estimated cost of materials does include any battery storage doesn't include any tower um, it's just the actual machine itself um, the sum I did there was for just someone asked me in the chat was for was for euros I assume 15 cents 
per kilowatt hour. I have no way to tell that. I pay 17 um, pence, so it, it's going to save me um, a bit more here. Um, um, 2.4, to answer that question, um, it's a small house. It, it could supply to. Um, a lot of people who employ this technology will have solar backup and um, potentially a generator as well if they're off grid. If you're on grid, it's a different question. Um, um, in terms of, I'm going to carry on and try and address these questions as I go. Um, sorry, there's, uh, there's a lot coming at me at once, but um, I'll carry on. Um, so essentially, if it's a it's a case by case thing as to how cost effective it is for you. One thing I would say is, um, if you're doing it simply on cost, um, it's you're probably better investing your money in in energy reduction tech um, technology, um, which you may have already done. Um, it it's it's borderline. Um, Cost effective, but if you're wanting to, if you're off grid, then it, it can be a great solution. If it, if you have a an investment in being more green, then it's 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 great. Um, and if you want a project that you get gets you to sink your teeth into the fundamentals of how this stuff works, then it is really um, quite an entertaining exercise. It brings the, the technique that I'm going to present brings. Um, Carpentry together with um, metal work, mechanics, and electrics. So it's quite a well rounded project. Um, and yeah, so there's some, um, there's different characteristics as to what you, which, which turbine you choose, but, um, and what you're needing it for. But that's a case by case thing, and I, I could talk about that for a long time, but I'm just, I'm just wanting to present. That this is what we're looking at as a, as a as a rough guess, but my sense for for payback is more like once you add batteries, etc., it gets closer to let's say seven to ten years. Um, and if that's if that's the kind of basis that you're working on, then then that's okay. Um, and obviously you have to add in some maintenance costs as well, which I'll, I'll address later on. Okay, so moving to the next slide, we've got um, just a, a demonstration of the, the type of wind turbine we're talking about. Um, it is horizontal axis, um, three blade system, and uses a tail and vane apparatus to to manage the the the, the direction of the turbine as well as the the, the braking or furling, as I presented before. Um, I'll just talk through this. Uh, okay, next next topic is the blade construction. So I'm just going to now talk through the different components and what's involved in the, in the in the production of this machine and and the steps involved. Um, so here's the here's the turbine in situ. As you can see, um, we've got wooden blades, uh, and the me the mechanics and the frame is is just standard uh, steel. And the tail is there. Um, we use a little bit of ply for that. So essentially, a lot of the materials are really stock standard. We've got um, angle iron um, and some iron pipe, uh, flat bar, also some plywood and some and some. Um, I think in this case we used larch as the as the blades. So um, let me say, there's no reason you can't you you couldn't use a composite blade or a pre-made blade. Um, the the benefit of using timber is that with 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 some labour, you can you can build three blades for for very cheap. Um, and someone's just asked me, is it a prototype? Okay, so pro probably good for me to clarify that that um, this is uh, this is the machine we'd install. Um, not necessarily in this to produce on on mass scale. It's more like a DIY, case by case, um, project by project thing. Um, okay, I'll just take the microphone down a bit. My wife would be happy with how well I'm multitasking here. Okay, I just lost me. Okay, um, let me talk more about the blades. Um, um, before I do, 
uh, just a, a labelled diagram of the blades. Um, a few things to take into consideration is the, the leading edge is um, the edge that, that, that uh, travels into the wind and then we've got a trailing edge which is the opposite um, in the tip. So essentially what we're, we're creating with the with these wooden blades is an aerofoil. Um, essentially the same thing as a propeller on a plane um, used in the reverse fashion. Um, and I'm sure everybody's seen this kind of shape before. Um, this is an example of, of the carving of the wood you can see in this part. We start with a block and we're going to remove that and that um, essentially. Um, one thing to consider too, um, are the blades flat? Okay, someone's just asked me a question of the blades flat. This might answer the question. Um, the blades we build have a twist. Um, so we're, we're, we're building a, a Aero 4 blade um, that twists down its length. So the reason that the blades do that is, is to achieve the maximum um, um, extraction of wind energy at all, all of its, along its whole length. So obviously the, 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 the angle of attack of the wind at different parts along the blade is optimised by a different angle. So this diagram you can see the yellow section is the tip of the blade. Very bad drawing of that. But, um, and you can see it twists down, the, twists down to the root of the blade, which is here. And we, we, we achieve that by carving, um, carving the blade. And the, the process of building the blade, we can see here we start with a, a, wooden, a wooden template and then begin carving um, in, a, in a methodical fashion because we have to achieve that twisting with quite precise, um, yeah, quite precisely. So it's a very methodical process and we, we, it needs to be because we need three blades that are essentially the same shape. Obviously there's always human error and we deal with that later by balancing the blades. But um, this is where we start. Um, this is a little example of, of the, you know, the, the instruction in, in getting the blade to a, a, you know, a twisted aerofoil shape. Um, and as you can see here, this is the, the leading edge along here. And trailing edge here. So this bit will, will be carved away. Um, and then it can't obviously be a lot. This will all be gone. And we'll end up with a with a um, twisted blade. Okay, still someone's asked a question here. Steel blades are less effective or harder to manufacture. Generally, wouldn't use steel um, just because of the weight. Um, composite blades, uh, yes, can be more efficient and. But there's just technicality in manufacturing them. So we're, we're, let me just say, with this technique of designing wind wind turbines, is um, you can get you can get incremental increases in fish in efficiency by doing things better. But in a sense, they're not cost effective in some of our eyes. You know, people who are working with this stuff. Um, so. Essentially, you can get a very, fairly good result with a with a, a wooden blade. Um, might cost you 15 pounds in materials. Um, you could buy a composite set of blades for um, 200 pounds, maybe or 200 euros, let's say. Um, and then it starts to really drive the cost of your machine up. And as we saw, there's only so much energy you can extract from the wind, and the more your cost, the less cost effective the system becomes. So we, we use wood. Um, for that reason. Um, so, so everyone, they keep, they keep, people keep me honest here, yes, possibly a twist for an engine rather than a windmill in that blade. I must say I, 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 I've extracted a lot of this stuff from the internet and at first glance it looked okay. So anyway, we're, we're here with, um, we're here with the blade itself as it's been carved. Um, just another example of, of working away with those blades. Um, essentially, using 
ha- carpentry hand tools, things like chisels, spoke shaves, drawing knives, um, wood planes, all, all fun um, things to use if, if you, you like working with wood. Um, it's just an example of uh, the finishing of the blades. We've got three blades which are essentially the same now um, and just finishing them off um, as well as we can, making everything's uh, in order. And that's um, northwest Scotland in the background there. Um, there's, there's sun somewhere there, mostly cloud. So, um, so where are we? Okay, so yeah, so these these wood blades here, looking again, and 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 again, as someone's just pointed out there, there, there's 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 going to be imperfections in these blades, and and whilst there's a whilst they're not premium efficiency, um, they're robust, they work well, and they do the job, um, and like I said before, you could spend more energy getting your blades tip top. Um, but then you may lose that in the alternator and, and other parts of the machine. So it's a little trade-off and, and it's personal preference. You know? um, <clears throat> good question, you, you, Alec, you, you're a little bit psychic. So um, larch or cedar are good woods to use. Um, can use pine and spruce as well. Light, light woods um, as uh, recommended. Hard woods just... Um, Create too much gyroscopic force in the machine, so the light, lighter the better. That's why we wouldn't use steel. Um, so this is just a representation of it's important to, to be careful about what what the grain structure of the wood you choose. Uh, if we're going to cut a blade out of this bit of wood here, it's likely to bu- it's likely to cup itself just the way the grain wants to go when it dries. So you want to avoid a bit of wood like that. These two are okay. Um, with the with the third one being the best, um, just based on the grain, not as easy to get hold of, um, but but it, it's a, it's the best grain for for, for creating a robust and, and you know, strong and reliable blade. <coughs> so, um, let me move on here. So someone's just asked me a question about the measurements for the blade. If you're really interested, then get online, buy Hugh's book. Um, It'll sort you out for all this stuff. Um, Ten pounds to buy it as a PDF. Fifteen pounds as a hard copy. Um, and I hope Paul mentioned that we're going to be doing a training in Poland um, with Kasia soon. So, um, those of you who are interested, please please feel free to inquire more about that at the end. Um, so here's the blade assembly put together, um, and the process of doing so. Um, and again, it's a it's it's quite a precise science. We need we need the measurements to be you know close, you know, because we don't want this thing to vibrate. And uh, the blade tips need to be equidistant from one another, and the system needs to be well 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 put together. Um, and just to come back to another picture there, sorry. Um, come back to how we deal with the difference in the weights, the blades, for them being a little bit. Um, human error in carving and in case you, uh, you take a bit too much wood out. We, we balance the blades at the end. Um, this little bit of lead, well, big bit of lead actually, you can see here, um, is balancing this blade, which um, for some one reason or another was a, a quite a bit lighter than the other two. So the process of balancing um, is... Uh, is um is, is kind of uh, mounting the the machine on on a bench um, on a, on on its bearing and then testing um, with bits of weight lead essentially where where the um, the imbalances are. Um, someone's just asked about the, the quantity of blades. Um, three blades three blades is kind of the we use as a good design point. You can use two blades. You can use three blades. The more Generally, the more blades, the more torque you create. Like an old old uh, windmill from Holland or maybe Poland, I don't know, um, is creating a lot of torque. Um, so it's grinding the mill or 
in the case of Australia, we have windmills with, with lots of blades and that's drawing water out of the ground from a long distance. A lot of torque. When you're dealing with electricity though, you need speed. Um, torque's not as big an issue, so the speed is critical. Um, so the less blades, the better, essentially. So here's um, blade ready to be installed. Okay, I'm going to travel on to the mechanics now. I'm trying to sort of to move along a bit. Um, always takes longer in practice. So here again is the the picture of the of the the turbine. Um, and what we can see here is what I'm going to talk about: some mechanics. There's a there's the alternator frame. There's what's called the yaw bearing. Your your bearing um, allows the machine to swivel into the wind. I keep missing the camera. Swivel into the wind, and essentially it's pretty rough and ready, but it does the job. It's a, a pipe, steel pipe, another steel pipe over the top, a cap on the top, and some um, grease to allow it to turn, and it does the job as good as any. And a good thing about it is it's robust. Um, what you'll find as you work with this kind of machinery for a while. Robust is is key. It's not like a solar panel which you just put in place and it does does what it does. These machines are like a car; they're turning all the time. They need maintenance and they need grease. And and if we had a bearing in there, like a proper ball bearing or a roller bearing, just adds to the maintenance. And this does the job quite well. Um, so we've got a tail hinge here as well, which just allows the tail to hinge. I'm um, going to move along. It's the uh, example of the frame. As we can see, the materials are, are easy to find. Um, angle iron here, um, some angle iron together. There's, this is the bearing in the front here that will attach to the blade system. Um, here's the yaw bearing. Um, example of, you know, it, the, the, the mast will, will fit up inside here and will allow that to yaw around. Okay, um, how's it look in practice? There's a bit of welding involved. Um, anyone interested in doing it would be, quite, be required to do a bit of arc welding um, and fun. Um, we, we would eventually paint this we just uh, to make it look nice and, and avoid erosion. A um, little bit more kind of uh, Preparation of that frame, the yaw bearing on top, um, getting prepared and in place, the right angle. And we've got the tail hinge here, which is essential. It's at the right angle as well. So there's a, there's a process with getting that all in place. It's not just stick in place. So um, one of the guys uh, doing the welding, putting that in place. And then here we end up with the with the assembly essentially. Um, with the yaw bearing up here, tail hinge here, and then the alternator frame. So the alternator will fix on here, as well as on the bearing. So let me just say that the bearing we use is a is a trailer hub bearing, like an automotive trailer hub bearing, or a, actually a smaller trailer bearing. Yeah, people can you can use. Um, bearings from vehicles, um, wheel bearings, they, they work well, they can make them withstand. Uh, it's not the first time I've, I've been told to look like Slatin, but um, <laughs> I'll carry on. Um, so yeah, the wheel bearing is essentially a good good use. Um, we use a trailer hub bearing um, for this design. And as you can see, this is what the bearing looks like. We usually cut off the, the shaft here. Um, and mount it into the mount it into the, the frame. So here we are with the the uh, I guess the assembled frame. Um, we've got a bit of plastic covering over here just to protect the bearings. We want to keep the weather out of those bearings. Um, so we put a plastic shroud to to stop water getting in there and and, and reducing the amount of times we have to to pull it down and, and grease those bearings. Um, so just to give you an example of how this works, um, here's the center point for the, for the center of gravity, gravity of this machine. As you can see, it's slightly offset. The actual machine is slightly offset. So if it didn't have a tail, it would want to turn around with the wind. 
So that's why the tail's there, because the wind presses against this tail vane to push it back in this direction. Um, so they balance one another until such a time that this wind gets too strong and then this, this tail starts to turn around, um, to, to furl around, we say. Um, and I just lost the camera. Essentially, that's all part of the design, um, determining what size tail vane for what wind speed. Um, it's all sort of a, a balance of design um, and the offsets. It's all there's quite a lot to to consider in terms of how how it um, it balances itself. So example of when the wind gets too strong, this this tail starts to furl around, um, and and here we can see the tail is fully furled around. Um, so that machine would then be riding side on into the wind. The wind would be coming this way, and it would be still spinning, but side on into the wind and, and extracting less energy and less, it would be going at a slower speed. Um, just moving through these slides, picture of the tail, um, another example of the tail. I'm just going to move on to the metrics. Um, am, am I off grid? Um, no. We live on a micro grid here in the community we're in, um, so we, we, we import some, some energy export others. Um, so, moving on to the electrics. Um, so essentially, I may be talk, talking to people who already know this, but I, I, it's always good to, to pass through the fundamentals before we go too much further. Um, induced, we're, we're, essentially, we're dealing with induced currents, induced EMF or voltage, and Faraday's law. And essentially what I'm saying there is there's a, there's a fundamental phys physical law that if you pass a magnet past a coil of wire, in this case copper, um, you, you will induce a voltage in that wire. And that's essentially what we're dealing with. Um, nice little presentation here which I hope works. Um, was a, it was a clip. I don't think it's going to play, but that's okay. So. Um, Essentially, as this north pole, south pole swivels around, we get differing voltages generated in these different coils. And let's, for, for, inter for, for example's sake, um, and yes, we induce both voltage and current. If we, if we close the circuit, we're going to have a current, obviously. Um, so, we, ha yeah, so we're we're induced we're, in this in this diagram. Unfortunately, it doesn't play the video, which would have been nice for, for those who haven't been introduced to this before to see. Essentially, we produce a a, a three-phase signal like this, um, which is what we achieve with this kind of alternator. Um, and just to move through the theory and into the actual practical, this is an expanded view of the the alternator itself um, with the magnets here, you can see an example of the magnets around here. Um, they're mounted on a steel uh, steel plate, uh, two magnet rotors in this case. It can be one in some cases. Um, and then we've got the stator, which is filled with uh, copper coils. So each of these is a copper coil. Um, and these, these magnet rotors are using, in our case, they're using neodymium magnets which um, uh, are a powerful magnet, um, which are quite fun to play with, actually. They're, they're, they're an aggressive little thing, and they they're north and south love each other a lot, and they can be uh, quite jumpy. So for those of you who have got your finger caught between them, you'll know what I mean. Um, so let me just jump forward and give you an example of the coils. Um, hopefully that works for us. Okay, so this is an example of the copper coils, um, as as demonstrated in that in that image before. Um, essentially, just um, enamelled copper wire coiled round and around and around. The reason we use enamelled copper wire is because the enamel creates an insulator between two wires lying together, so we can actually create a, a like a 
a single path for the for the, the parent. Um, going back, so um, I'll come back to that. Um, a couple of questions coming through here, which look maybe of interest. Um, it's all happening a bit quick, so I'll, I'll carry on. Um, the three factors determining voltage um, is the speed that the, that the magnet travels through the coil, um, essentially the speed of the RPM of the machine, the amount of magnetic flux. So the stronger the magnets, the the, the more voltage. I just lost my camera. Okay, as as magnets come closer together, the magnetic flux increases. So as we move further apart, it reduces. So our machine ideally is a, a balance between allowing the parts to move, but being as close as possible, those magnets as close as possible to in, to maximise this magnetic flux. Also, the voltage is dependent on the number of coil turns. Um, so. So here's an example of how that all kind of ties together, different designs. Um, and so the number of, number of magnets and number of coils are, are kind of codependent. Um, and I didn't put an image in which shows that, but I think um, we can just take that for granted for now. Um, and the number of coils you can see, see here, um, for instance, for a 2.4, 24 volt machine. We've got 45 coils, uh, uh, turns per coil. If we're going to double the voltage, the linear relationship, so we're going to go to 48 volts, we've got to do those turns 90 times. Uh, yeah, 90 times. Um, so, yeah, so that's, uh, this is all part of the, like the design philosophy that you'd have to run through if you were, if you were developing your own design. Um, and if you if you're an engineer or a physicist or a really uh, keen mind, then this could be your the avenue. If you like me and you have a family, you probably don't have that time. Um, so carrying on, don't get too tied down in that. Um, so yeah, here's a picture of the coils again. Um, process um, of design. He uses a a lot of templates and a lot of jigs just to get things precisely positioned. Um, obviously the position of the magnets is important relative to the coils and I can sort of give you an illustration of that now. Um, this is the wiring for the three phase um, alternator um, and I'll try and demonstrate. So this is the wire in and this is the wire out here. If you trace these around you'll see this one goes around to third one and then again around. So what you'll see is this coil, this coil, this coil and this coil are all in series and they're, let's call them phase one. The same would occur for each the other one. So um, and what happens is we've configured the magnets in such a way that when when there's a magnet passing through that part of that coil, there's a magnet also passing through that part of that other coil. So we're multiplying the voltage that um, is occurring as they turn around. <coughs> and then there's three phases of that, which um, which gives us the, the result we need. Um, here again, just working with the coils, we just uh, started the wiring process and pinned them down. Um, and then ready and in the mould for resin. Um, the this is the magnet rotor, so a steel disc under here. Um, we've got a, a magnet magnet sort of uh, locating jig that we build um, just to allow the magnets to be precisely placed. Placed. Um, so then the next process is just putting the magnets on the on the plate um, and with a lot of respect you'll see this little jig here we, we use to sort of slide that slot them into place um, because if they clap down on the plate too hard 
um, can damage the magnets and, and also the, the, the coating, thin coating on these neodymium magnets, um, which just sort of welcomes corrosion, which is not ideal. Um, so there we can see the magnet rotor with uh, the template in this mould here, ready to, to, to apply resin. This diagram of the of the mould itself, um, we put it in a you know in a in a base, and then we have a lid um, and an island in the middle, which uh, just avoids resin being poured into that middle section of the of the. Um, yeah, sorry, they're, they're neodymium magnets. Um, you can use normal ferrite magnets. Um, just the design used here is, is chosen to use neodymium just for the, the, the extra flux you get from those. Um, but you can use ferrite magnets, it's no problem. Um, someone asked a question before, can you use a stand motor for this? Um, you need, if you're going to use a motor for any kind of generation, it needs to be a permanent, uh, uh, Permanent magnet motor, which means that um, type of alternator is is um, is the way the, the motor is designed. It's got magnets as well as coils. A lot of motors just have coils and coils. So no, in some cases no. And it, I've I've found it hard in Europe to get hold of secondhand permanent magnet motors. Um, and you may know of somewhere to get them, and if you do, then you can you can use that um, and not reinvent the wheel. In some cases you have to do rewiring. Um, so hopefully that answers that question that comes through before. Um, here's a, the moulding process. Um, Stator, of course. Um, oh, jumped a bit forward there. I'm just going to grab that. We used a polyester resin. Um, you could use epoxy resin. Polyester is a good sort of middle ground in terms of cost and 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 um, how it um, how it performs. Um, here's resin in the mould, um, heating up and off gassing a bit. It's, um, it's quite a, a hot process. Um, and here we go. We've got the the moulds the next day. Um, the the casts the next day. Um, we use a Vaseline in the in the moulds just so that they come out. Otherwise, it would bind to the to the wood substrate and we might have a problem. So there's the two rotors, um, stator, and um, needs a bit of cleaning up once it comes out, but it's uh, essentially ready to go. And then here's the assembly of the whole apparatus. Um, you can see the rotors, which has got the magnets on them. Yeah, I, could, I guess you could say that's the magnet there. Um, the hubs, and then this is the stator through here with the coils. And then the frame and our bearing here. Um, and then our blades will attach to this bit. Um, it's assembling the alternator. Um, and uh, yeah, te some testing on the, on the bench. Um, and here it is, kind of ready to go with the blades on the front here. Um, and you can see this gap between the stator and the and the rotors is very minimal. We want to we want to keep it as minimal as possible. Um, someone just asked, do the generators burn? I've never seen a generator. Um, no. No, not in not not in these machines. I'd say I guess is is possible, but um, there's not really any flammability introduced into this design. Um, I guess cable, but um, yeah. So that's it, ready to go. Um, let's just jump through. I'm conscious of time here, so I'm just going to move ahead. Um, installation. Okay, some things to consider with installation is sighting. Obviously, where you're going to put it, how you're going to put it up. Um, we use a mast system generally with guy ropes. Um, you could use uh, um, like a tower frame. Um, you could essentially you usually need to 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 use guy ropes um, unless you've got a serious kind of um, foundation for for it, which is um, unlikely. Um, we also employ this this um, what's called a gym pole to lift the the mast up and down for maintenance and such. Um, 
Um, here's an example of uh, the guy ropes. Just a nice photo showing that. In, in that case, there's kind of it's a bit like this. You know that that one's got three guys because it was quite a tall tower. Um, and, and then there's a winch for for pulling this gin pole up and down. We put a winch on on this point here. And, um, oh, what am I doing? Yeah, winch on that point, and we can we can crank it up and down. Um, okay. So it's on its way up there, um, and yeah, it looks complicated. It's it's quite quite a lot of fun um, getting them up and down. But it, once you've done it once, it's, it's, it's straightforward. Um, Okay, I don't understand that. Anyway, so, so the use of the use of the power um, is is critical. I guess you ask yourself that question before you you even embark on this exercise. Um, I will put it at the end because it's um, a little bit hot, you know, sort of heavy topic. Um, essentially, batteries um, is way. If you're off grid, people go with batteries. Um, it's the most effective way of storing. Currently, we have ideally we, we have some. Some better technologies coming along in the next 10 years to, to help renewables along the way. Um, but essentially, we've got a wind turbine itself. Um, it produces AC electricity, three phase AC. Pass it through a rectifier, which turns it to DC. Um, small component that does that. And then we can pass it into batteries. Um, it's important to know once the batteries are full, you have to have somewhere for the energy to go, because if the machine is unloaded, which means it doesn't have any electricity draw off it, it um, it can run away in high winds. We say run away, which means it just continues to speed up and speed up and speed up and speed up until such a time as the speed is is destructive. Um, so. Yeah, so essentially, just someone's asked me the question about how it's going to be controlled. That's a, it's a case by case scenario, but you do you need uh, some controllers. Essentially, if you're using batteries, some charge controllers to manage the charge of the batteries. Also, a load controller, um, which can be an integrated unit, which then dumps the load. So, going back to the point is that once the batteries are full, we need something that can 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 uh, where we can put the the excess energy. So some people put it into hot water um, with an immersion element and heat some water. Um, some people may heat the bit of their house in such a way. Others may um, use it um, for just to just dump it to the air. Um, anyway, that that's uh, that's that's what that sort of um, the conversation you have to have with yourself. Um, someone said water heaters are their solution. I, I tend to like water heaters. Some people like the electricity. Um, the, the course we're going to do in Poland, we, we're, the people there want to put it into hot water, so we can just do direct to hot water, um, which uh, seems neat. Um, except I guess you just have to manage how how your other hot water source works. Um, three phase electricity, AC to DC electricity. Um, essentially, this component here is the rectifier, um, and not going into too much detail about it. Essentially, you go from a, a current, um, a signal like this, to one that's sort of basically a straight line and direct current. So that's just that explained. Um, here's an example of us putting it into hot water as a as a dump load. Still got batteries in line there, but um, you know, some people go straight into hot water. Um, one last thing to just to mention is is the um, brake switch. We need a brake switch um, in case the load gets disconnected. If there's a short circuit somewhere between the turbine and the bat, say, um, we need something to slow it down in the event of high winds. So we put a, a brake switch in in, in line, um, but it's either automatically or manually switched um, to stop it from running away. Um, this is just a it in situ, charging some batteries, um, voltmeter I needed there. And that's me. So thanks for your patience and, and probably struggling to understand my accent. Um, just before I finish, I will add that 
um, we've got a course coming up in Poland um, at Karsha and Karls Community um, near Gdansk, and that's in May. Um, we're running it from a Wednesday to a Sunday to try and minimise the amount of time people have to take off work. And we're going to be building a 24 volt machine, um, 2.4 metre diameter. Um, with a picture of Karl and Karsha there, two friends from Pintorn who now live in Poland. Karsha's Polish. Um, and I believe she's about to say something now. Um, and there's the house. It's a, it's a living course essentially, unless you're a local person. So we'd all be staying together and eating together and um, possibly teaching me some Polish. And, and then we'd be working in the day to, to develop the, the machine. Another picture of their produce and then Carl with his cow. And uh, I guess now we're going to move into some questions, um, which I, I'm assuming Powell I just address. Um, can using, okay, what someone said here, um, can using batteries ensure a continuous power supply? Yeah, sure. Um, it depends what you mean by continuous. You can run, um, you can put an inverter in, in the system and run anything you would find in a normal household, yes. Obviously, the amount of storage you have is dependent on the number of batteries and how much you can afford. Um, car batteries, not ideal in theory can be used, but um, they're, they're not a deep cycle battery, what's called a deep cycle battery, so they, they, they're, they're good for giving a lot of, a lot of um, current to the starter motor in the car, but they don't hold charge, deep, uh, lots of charge well. So, um, yeah, okay, so I think there's some questions coming through that maybe I'll just address before the other ones. Um, horizontal turbines more effective than vertical. Okay, so a little bit more on that. Um, essentially, the, the more efficiencies. Um, it's, it's a struggle to get a, a vertical axis turbine up high. Um, people struggle with that. They're generally on the ground, um, so your wind speeds are less. So you, you, you're sort of not, not optimising your sighting. Um, also, there's a mechanical issue with the bearing because um, uh, just the nature of the way it spins, it's a, it, it creates a, um, yeah, complications for the bearings. It's a common failure on those machines. And another thing is too that the, the blades have a, um, when you think about it, as they go around, they see wind on one side and then when they come back around they see wind on the other side. And it creates a stress, like a reoccurring stress on the blade which fatigues the blades really quickly. If you've got a propeller, it's only ever seeing wind on one side, so it's kind of, it's not like, you know, if you get a bit of wire and you twist it backwards and forwards, it's the, it's the, it's the back and forward that breaks it. If you just have it one way, it, it kind of lives a lot longer. Um, so so that, that's essentially some of the issues that you come up with those, those machines. And, and they're sort of still not, there's no real commercial successes, I would say. Um, and maybe that I don't know of. Um, so, Anyway, um, what kind of batteries are better? Deep cycle batteries, um, uh, there's various different technologies of battery. Um, and yeah, the d deep cycle batteries is what you need. Um, and there's, with a little bit of searching online, you can see that there's, there's several different um, technologies, absorbent glass and that technologies. So I won't go into it in any great detail. Um, so let me, I think I've kind of got most of the questions on there. Um, mushrooms, yes, I think they were mushrooms. <laughs> so back to these questions here. What resources for for interesting DIY projects could you recommend? Well, if you go to Hugh's site, if you're interested in wind directly, um, then he's got a lot of good resources uh, linked on there. Um, also, he does a little bit of hydro too. So if hydro is your opportunity in where you live, then um, it's a similar concept um, that can be employed um, to build a hydro turbine. Um, okay, the best way to store energy produced by turbines. Um, essentially, batteries is the, the, unfortunately the way people have to go um, in terms of you know, maximising their efficiencies and lead acid batteries are the, are the, are the, are the most common and the most cost effective. Um, that we've got. Um, 
gel batteries. Yeah, sure. That's a that's a good a good point. Um, okay, someone's just sorry there on the on the chat. Um, tell us a bit about the cost and investment rate of return on such. I'm going to address that up the top, but let's say seven to ten years is kind of as realistic in my eyes. Um, the, the the numbers presented in the in the presentation were less, but that was just for the turbine. If you've already got a tower and batteries, um, maybe for your solar system, then yeah, obviously it becomes a much more, um, yeah, it, re it reduces the cost. Um, what laws and regulations should we be aware of? Um, not not really where in Poland, maybe someone can, can support you in the chat there if you're still online. Um, but I'd, essentially there's there's two to consider. One is is um, putting the tower up and, and what are the regulations about that. The other one would be um, if you were going to feed it into the grid via an inverter. So if you if for some reason or another you've got a utility that will pay you for your energy, which is the case in some European countries, then there's regulations to consider there. Um, Traditional mills or those vertical constructed in Poland. I think we're talking we're talking about wind turbines. Um, can I use it for 230 volt electronics? Yes, you can. Um, you so you've either got generally 12, 24, or 48 volt battery systems. You need an inverter to then convert it to two back to 230 volts, um, and that and it be AC. Um, some people go a bit. A bit, get very inventive and realise that a lot of our appliances run off DC. They have their own transformers. My laptop, for example, goes from AC via a transformer back to DC. Some people get very creative and run it, run their, use the DC directly. But it's it's a, it's quite a process to do that. Um, big loss in switching from DC to AC. Some of the inverters now are quite efficient, you know, 80%, 90% even in some cases. Um, AC to DC effective. Um, yeah, yeah, I think, um, I think, yeah. Is it noisy? <laughs> no, not really. Um, no, you can definitely hear them depending on how far they are from your house. Um, but I think, uh, in my eyes, I don't find wind obtrusive as a noise. But um, um, that's just my own kind of my own thing. But um, take a walk near one of the big ones, you'll see. Hey, Paddy, do you hear me? Just... Yes. Uh, I propose that we can. Uh have uh, what, like 10 minutes more on questions from the pr uh, presentation and then we can add uh, we can add voice to Kasha okay okay sure sure so please keep the questions coming um, I'll just as I'm waiting um, I'm looking at these questions here um, where to set them up how to check for optimal setup, position, direction, and so forth. Okay, so position, I guess you're trying to find the windiest place on your property. Um, hilltops, for example. Um, I've seen them I've seen them in amongst trees, but with a, a tower that's high enough to get them above the treetops. And that's okay, you can still get good wind if you're in a windy site. Um, they they self-direction themselves, so that's not an issue. Um, if you're going to put more than one, um, you've got to consider the, the how far they are from one another. Um, some people say seven diameter rotor diameters from one another, um, so seven times the, the diameter from each other, or that some people actually say 15. So that's, you know, the experts are now saying 15 is better. Um, do you need to protect the wind time, turbines from lightning? Um, good question. Um, yes, so essentially you would earth, you would have to earth um, the tower um, and and the, and the system itself. So uh, and depending how far your your from your turbine is from your house, you know you could use your it's your the earthing on your house to earth it, but um because there's already no stake in the ground. Um, so yeah, it's a consideration. Um, 
how long do your white turbines can last in years? Okay, so they they can last up to twenty years. These machines. Um, they I will add that they do take maintenance, um, and the maintenance typically is um, once a year, um, taking them down for inspection. You know, if you get debris flying into the blades, you can damage the blades. You'll need, you'll need some greasing on the bearings and different parts of it. Um, sometimes the electrical component, the, the rectifier can blow because it's doing a quite a heavy job. But usually you sight that at the bottom of the tower um, and you can do it, do it <coughs> on the ground. Um, so yeah, the, the, if you look after them, you can get 20 years of life. Um, let's say 10 years is a as a kind of a middle ground from what I've heard from, from folks who's, who are in and around a lot, a lot of them. Um, and you might only have to rebuild parts of them and you can still have essentially the same machine. Um, I've seen a big L heat sink. Okay, that was on the electronics. That's on the basically on the rectifier um, creating heat. Um, I think it was the, the photo you would have seen. Um, yep. Um, it's the most economic wind power or solar power. Um, depends on your location, really. Um, and and government rebates can be helpful in, in countries like uh, the UK. But um, it's a case by case. I'm sorry I can't answer that directly, but it's a case by case thing. I would say if you're in a very windy site, then and it depends on how much sun you get. To be honest, but lots of people do both. If they, you know, but it takes them several years if they're off grid to, you know, have that much money to do both. Um, so, what have we got here? Please describe the optimum magnet placement. Um, that's probably a little bit detailed. It says the question is describe please the rules of building turbines and optimum magnet placement. Essentially, the magnets need to be placed in a way that they, each magnet passes into the, that, the coil of that phase at the same time. I don't know if that makes full sense, but it's, it's the kind of the, the principle we're working with. Um, exploitation costs, cheap maintenance. Yeah, I think I've spoken to maintenance. Um, have I tried to mold the blades from plastic? I haven't personally, um, but. Um, there is there is Polish firm that the Kasha made me aware of that, that do a, a pol, uh, I think a polymer or a composite blade, um, and yeah, I mean the big the big blades they still use a fiberglass kind of um, technology sometimes. So so yeah, there's different ways to to, to do this. Um, the blades the blades is I wouldn't argue that the blades used here are, are the best you can do, but um, like I said, it's a it's a balance between um, cost and and effectiveness, and I'm sure you can create a better blade. And there's, there's people paid big money for that. So, um, I think I've got most of the questions there. Um, okay, how far how far apart turbines be? I think I answered that seven to fifteen um, diameter turbine diameters. Um, 3D printed blades, go for it. That would be great. <laughs> that would save a lot of work. Um, and yeah, I haven't had a lot of experience with 3D printing, but I know it's a, an emerging technology that's possibly very promising. Um, whether it can withstand the stresses, um, I'm not sure. Um, could there be an I love renewable energy written over the blades? I think there could. Um, uh, has anyone tried to build wind turbine towers? I guess that means with more than one turbine on the tower. And yes, people have. So um, is, 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 it's, it's possible. Um, less cost on the tower. You have one tower, maybe with a cross arm and, and two turbines, or however uh, many. Yeah, it's definitely been worked with before. Um, are these kind of turbines threat to, to animals? Work near one, and we found dead gulls around. Um, occasionally, there is uh, someone's just asked a question about the, the threat to animals. Um, occasionally, a bird will 
will fly into the into the blades and and unfortunately it usually kills them. Um, but it's very rare. It's very rare. I mean, um, Hugh, who I I've asked about this. Yeah, he's he said um, someone's just put one bird a year. Maybe that that seems right, and that's quite rare, you know. Um, I'd, I'd say the, the household cat would probably kill a um, hundred times that. Um, yeah, and you can eat the bird rockets <laughs> and grill. <laughs> so yeah, um, yeah, I think I'll keep I'll keep going with these questions in the chat. And please, Powell, jump in when you're ready to to kind of cut me off, and we can we can finish there. Um, ah. Oh, congratulations! You have a you have um, your son or your daughter with us. Yeah, my daughter is listening to you very carefully. So hopefully she will build one, build one turbine in the next few years. <laughs> Maybe I should I get mine. And yeah, I think we could uh, slowly come to the end of the presentation. Uh, maybe here. you could. Maybe you could. Choose uh, one more question to answer, and then we will uh, uh, give uh, Kasha a voice. Great. Um, okay, we've got some questions about birds here, um, and yeah, I think I addressed that. There's some good suggestions. Um, uh, what's this one? Yeah. Are oh, the turbines that employ a sail model instead of a mill model? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there is a lot of inventive designs, but um, this is typically the most robust kind of way to go. Um, I feel like getting my daughter now because uh, I see that we've got another one online. So, <laughs> but um, I think uh, I think we're finished unless someone wants to shoot me a quick, quick last question in English, maybe. Looks like we're, 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 yeah, I'm coming. Yeah, thank okay, you. thank you, uh, Paddy. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's a sign that nobody has another, more questions. So I would like to very thank you for a very good introduction to building turbines. I hope your workshop uh, in Poland will go well and. You lose power. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Paddy. Thank you. I'm so proud of you. Say hello. 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 Who has me today? Okay, dobra. To ja już nie gadam. Przekazuję głos do Kasi. Kasiu, opowiedz nam o, o twoim miejscu i o tym miejscu, gdzie, gdzie będą warsztaty. I dziękujemy, Paddy. Dzięki, dzięki. Paddy, could, Paddy, could you switch off microphone and say hello to your daughter? Okay, so thank you, Paddy, again. Dzięki. So, um, ja powiem tylko kilka słów o tym, że organizujemy warsztat. Uczył. Paddy będzie um, prowadził ten warsztat budowy wiatraka według um, według e, tej instrukcji, o której, o której mówił Hugh Pigota, e, czyli e, projekt już jakby widzieliście. E, pięć dni warsztatu na Kaszubach w maju od 12 do 17. E, chcemy postawić u nas e, na razie jeden wiatrak, taki warsztat pilotażowy. Zobaczymy jak to idzie, jak to działa i potem Mamy, mamy marzenie postawić jeszcze trzy. E, miejsce jest piękne, zapraszamy zainteresowanych i e, kontakt do nas będzie wpisany po, e, po webinarze. Do Macie pytania, zapraszam. No to wszystko, to wszystko, dzięki. Hello. 
Bardzo e, dzięki dobrze. Kasiu, już jestem, trochę to trwało zanim się włączyłem. E, dzięki za przedstawienie tutaj waszego projektu i zaproszenie na warsztaty. E, słuchajcie, powoli kończymy. Dziękuję serdecznie za dzisiejszą obecność. E, dzięki serdeczne w, i w imieniu wszystkich dzisiaj uczestników e, do Padiego. Thank you, Paddy. Uh, I hope we will uh, continue our conversation after your workshop. Please send us uh, uh, photos. We will send uh, those to everybody from this uh, webinar. E, chciałbym przypomnieć, że wyślemy wam dzisiaj e, w podziękowaniach Wyślemy wam prezentację, a dla tych z was, którzy mają e, bilet dla fanów w ciągu 36 godzin wyślemy zapis e, oraz też inne materiały, które tam wspominaliśmy na wydarzeniu. E, dzięki serdeczne, zapraszamy na kolejny webinar już w sobotę na temat budowy ogrodów w domu. Będzie na temat małych ogrodów, jak to robić w domu. E, kolejny wątek dotyczący samowystarczalności, a już teraz Zegna się z wami najmłodszy uczestnik dzisiejszego webinaru prawie i pewnie e, tak, najmłodszy, najmłodsza uczestniczka Zoja i do zobaczenia e, na następnych spotkaniach. Cześć, cześć, cześć.